The term regime change has entered into the vocabulary of our daily lives. We hear it tossed around casually on news reports, but the actual idea of regime change is radical and weighty. Is removing the government of another country ever the right thing to do? We examine the ethics of regime change today on The Professors. From across the city and the seven city colleges of Chicago, broadcasting from 63rd and Halsted at Kennedy King College, professors take the art of conversation to a higher degree. I'm Rashid Carter from Olive Harvey College. And joining me today are professors Antonio Vasquez from Wilbur Wright College, Agber Dima from Chicago State University, and from the University of Illinois at Chicago, Sean Dimple. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, given the context of the great dynamics of change uh, on the social and political and economic sphere, um, we have to entertain this question of what proper foreign policy looks like today. And given that context, is it ever socially responsible for one government to topple another? Sean, would you like to start us off? Well, <clears throat> it's not a simple yes or no question, obviously. You have to evaluate each country based on its particular status at the moment and what invading that country, toppling it, will ripple effects will have across the, the globe. Okay. So for instance, like in Germany during World War II, I think it was acceptable to go and topple the Nazi government because not only were they committing genocide in their own people, but across the entire continent invading different countries, eventually that would no doubt come to America and we had to go in and protect those people and overthrow that government. Okay. But then it gets more tricky in situations such as Libya. And why do we choose Libya and not, say, the Ivory Coast, which is undergoing uh, almost a brink of a civil war at the right. moment? That's right. So why Libya? Why not Ivory Coast? What is the determinant to go in or not? So what are some of those determinants, gentlemen? Any thought? Um, well, I think my answer to your question is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that where the government is violating human rights, killing people without justification, then humanitarian intervention is advised. But even in the context of humanitarian intervention, it should not be the action of one government. It should be multilateral arrangement under UN Charter to which these countries are party, meaning that they cannot violate human rights. And this is the understanding of sovereignty since World War II. No, in the sense that states are generally considered moral agents, but do they act in that way? They act in their own interest. So when they are acting in their own interest or to promote a hegemonic interest of particular strong nations, then the answer is of course no. And we can go into particular examples as we continue the program. And, and to reply to Sean, it would be that we're in Libya because Libya is one of the members of OPEC, the oil producing and exporting countries. It's an economic reason. Much like when the Soviet Georgia, the nation just at the underbelly of the Soviet Union, had a short uh, inter, um, uh, intervention by the Russian army, it wasn't so much that they were going back and reclaiming uh, people that felt they were being uh, uh, suffering any kind of uh, humanitarian rights issues, so much as the United States and the Soviet Georgia were going to put a natural gas pipeline that was going to be a competitor to the Russian gas pipeline, which they're able to lord over the European countries. So there's an economic rationale behind it. Okay, but, but what leadership structure determines this rationale, this criteria for determining where we go and um, intercede in foreign affairs? Should it be the leadership of our country? Should it be a groundswell of consensus from the citizens of a nation? Who, det who actually makes that determination? Well, That's something we have to consider, right? I'd like to offer an, an old idea from John Stuart Mill uh, talking about the idea of the power elite, right? That there is this group that by the virtue of their position as CEO of major corporations at various think tanks, that that is one group that goes in and determines where it is that we will intervene or not intervene. For example, while we look at the U.S. going and intervening in some place like Chile in the 1970s, it wasn't so much as the U.S. wanted intervention, it was the wealthy of Chile that were going to suffer through the nationalization of the oil industry and other industries. So the wealthy of that country, their power elite chose to go in and align themselves with the Americans. So again, that's because I'm an economist, so that's my point of view, and I'd like to hear what the other gentleman had to say. Uh, well, I think that I should add that uh, in terms of where to go and where not to go, the question which he posed 
most appropriately, I would say that the U.S. or any other strong nations cannot intervene everywhere in the world. They can, intervention, as Mr. Friedman has mentioned lately, is a matter of choice. Now, the U.S. cannot intervene in, in China, for instance, to stop human rights abuses sure. because the cost of doing so would be unacceptable. The U.S. cannot intervene in Georgia to free those people from the abuses from Russia because the cost of doing so will outweigh the benefits. So I understand that there is limitation to what the U.S. can do. I want to suggest, uh, actually reiterate the U.S. Uh, reasons for intervening and not intervening. Those who are included uh, in um, foreign policy uh, document uh, suggested by Caspar Weinberger, the Reagan's defense secretary. He identified six reasons why the U.S. should intervene and why it shouldn't intervene. The first of which is that in order to intervene, it has to be in the U.S. national interest. Secondly, the military and political objectives must be very clear. And thirdly, it has to be that they are going in to win. And thirdly, and fourthly, there has to be constant reassessment of the military and political objectives. And he identified that uh, going into any kind of intervention should be as a last resort. So these are the things. If we put this in the context of what is happening, was it in the U.S. interest to intervene in Rwanda? Rwanda has nothing to offer. Was it in the U.S. interest to intervene in Ivory Coast? So you look at this intervention, uh, whether you couch it in humanitarian basis, is not necessarily what is happening in the nations that is important. It is what is in the U.S. interest that is important, political or economic. Okay, so, so given, and I appreciate that very uh, well-delivered uh, perspective, but given uh, what we now know is this new world, um, this post 9-11 world, where we basically, um, and I hate to create a false dichotomy, but it seems like there's a juxtaposition between democracy and Islamic fundamental, uh, fundamentalism, or just democracy and then just what's not, not dem democratic. Within that context, and according to the criteria you just laid out, is our foreign policy structure now, is it valid? Is it something that meets the criteria, specifically when we talk about the way we intervene in the Middle East? Is that a valid intervention paradigm? Well, I'll try and give what I think is one possible answer. I would is, do it, so when you finish. <laughs> <laughs> is it, I, don't, I, I would say with the death of Osama bin Laden, we're finished with the post 9-11. We're pre-something. That is, we're looking at a rise of the democracies within the Middle East. We're looking at the GDP from China growing beyond the level of the U.S. They will reach our level of GDP within the next three or four years. So we will no longer be the dominant economic engine for the world where before our GDP represented 50 percent of the output of the world. We're going to go sliding down to 15%, much as the slidden down in England. We will now have other actors on the stage, so our policy has got to be different because we're going to be looking at other major players such as China and the Middle East should they decide to go in and exercise their democratic rights. They will have a lot of oil money with which to build their militaries, and they will be our potential friends. Okay. Could be frenemies. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's important is the rise of the BRIC nations, the Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, changing the scope of uh, geopolitics and the world economy. And I think Obama currently is beginning to realize that we need to start engaging with these different countries, sure. uh, especially like going into uh, the South American Convention and engaging with Brazil, because we always played with South America as our backyard, and now they're like, no more. And then you have Chavez, who's like revolution against the U.S. and they can also survive on their own and don't necessarily need our help or intervention anymore. That's right. Agba, you said you wanted to come. Yes. Uh, George W. Bush uh, was the first post-11 president. In terms of intervention, he adopted a policy that is very clear to us, the Bush Doctrine. Right. And the Bush Doctrine vacillated between unilateralism and internationalism, meaning that in certain cases, where the international community did not agree with him, he would go with his so-called coalition of the willing. 
Now, Obama is the second post 9-11 president. What he has done so far can be characterized as follows. He doesn't want to go in unilaterally and court the, the wrath of the Arabs. That is why he has taken essentially a, feed, a second fiddle in Libya. And the idea is that if I'm going to go in, I have to go in firstly because the American people are behind me in my action. Their representatives in Congress are behind me. In his foreign policy speech on Libya, you noted that he indicated that he consulted with the congressional leaders and they agreed that the U.S. Uh, involvement in Libya is important. So you would say that Obama has embraced internationalism true and true in his uh, policies in post 9-11. So our self-interest, it seems, is changing just a bit. And given some of the, the domestic crises we have at hand, uh, joblessness, uh, the debt issue, the deficit, it seems like we might maybe should be retrenching in terms of foreign policy and look to shore up home maybe just a bit more. So what does that mean in terms of our asking our um, other allies, so to speak, how, how, does, how, do, how do we go forward in terms of bringing other countries into the fold and promoting what we deem our best interests? How are they our best interests if they could potentially be co-opted by those we might work with? Well, sometimes the line between domestic policy and foreign policy is very blur. Indeed, because uh, certain actions that we take abroad are generally geared toward promoting our political and economic interests. So if you say getting involved in Libya should not be what we should be doing, we should be focusing on the budget deficit and the unemployment. Well, Libya supplies uh, petroleum to this nation, and petroleum feeds the industrial base that we use. So if we have shortage, that is going to impact adversely the economic dynamics in the nation. So that is why I say sometimes there is not a clear cut line between foreign policy and domestic policy in terms of how they affect us. In, in, in terms of also this idea of ideology, that is a neoliberal ideology, we may see, much as Sean said, that Latin America has gone to other ideas other than the traditional markets, that they may choose to go to, like in Germany, a social democratic kind of experience sure. where there's much more intervention for safety nets, that these, they might say, we don't like the way the Americans promote democracy. We do like the idea of representative government. We do like the idea of a, a, a group of leaders who are going to be held accountable for their decisions, but they may not because of either previous interventions or histories of understanding of the U.S. not decide to go along that neoliberal path. And that's what we need to get ready for and prepare for. And that, that's a good segue, uh, because the question that I have is, what responsibility does an overthrower have to the overthrown, right? uh, to the people who have to deal with this regime change on a day-to-day -day basis, whose lives have been fundamentally transformed because of what some foreign entity felt was a necessary change. What responsibility does the foreign entity, in this case maybe the United States of America, what responsibility do we have to the Iraqi citizens, to the Afghani citizens, to the citizens around the world that we deemed a regime change necessary for? I think that's a <clears throat> tricky question again because we say we're going to go in there and then when is the end? There's no clear deadline and you can't say it's going to end a specific date. And I think it's our responsibility when you go and make that decision to change the regime of another country, you just can't go in, you know, cause a disruption and chaos, get rid of the regime, and then leave a vacuum of power. And then that's when these other groups like the Taliban after uh, the war, in, the proxy war, essentially in Afghanistan against Russia, Correct. we, you know, funded the Mujahideen, and then basically we left. And there's no funding for schools, infrastructure, development that would have helped avoid the path that it eventually went into and us eventually coming back and invading it. 